I'd like to welcome director Daniel Rohr up to the stage. And film job subject and producer Maria Pevchuk. And of, we actually have another addition, editor Langdon Page is gonna join us as well. I am just shocked by this turnout tonight. This is like a full house. And you all stayed. <laughs> no, we're not sit we're standing for this Q and A. Yeah, we'll we'll stand. Is that no, this is great. It's okay. sort of like a dance floor you have here. I, it's almost like disco, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And I'd love to just hear how you got connected with Alexi and kind of what started this film project. Well, so often making documentaries, as I'm sure many of you know, if there are filmmakers in the audience, is, is the art of being in the right place at the right time. And I think this film in particular really embodies that notion. I was working with a few colleagues on a completely different film project. It was not going well. In October of 2020, we found ourselves in Vienna, Austria. I didn't have a job. I had no film to make. I was getting very upset. And that's when Christo Grozev, our, our Bulgarian nerd with a laptop, he walked in and he said, I know we can't make that other film, but there's a different story that you might be interested in. I was like, what's that, Christo? And, and almost in a whisper, as if he was telling me a state secret, he leans in and he says, you know that Navalny guy? I think I have a lead into who tried to poison him. And I was like, wow, Christo, that sounds great. Who's making that movie? And because of Christo's reputation and his journalistic pedigree, uh, we were able to go and meet with Alexei and Maria about uh, a week later. Um, I convinced, I think, Alexei pretty quickly that, that we should do this. I think I still have not convinced Maria that we should do this. Um, but the, the rest is history. Well, that leads into my next question, because I did see in the film how Maria was very much like, I loved watching you just consistently size up different situations. And I wondered, what did it take for you to kind of like open up and, and trust, maybe not fully trust, but trust enough to get this film made? Who told you I trusted them? <laughs> That's a strange assumption. Um, well, to be honest, like at some point, you know, there are those moments in your life when you meet people and you kind of just know. Um, they were pretty convincing, Daniel and um, the film's producer, Desiree. Um, they were very convincing. I told them, I asked them whether they were willing to show me their bank account, just to check whether they're paid by the Russian state or something like that. And both of them said, yes, sure, Maria, sure. I've, I've never had a look, probably should have. Um, so yeah, you know, just like a general, you know, a little bit of intimidation, a little bit of, you know, bad cop strategy. And um, I think this guy's um, caved immediately. And, to, uh, and again, and as I just started saying in the beginning, um, it was pretty obvious from the day we've met them that for these two, um, Daniel and Odessa, this project would be the project of their career so far. I'm adding this so far consciously because Daniel asks me to you do that. You can just say project of my career. Okay. I'm, but you are, I'm, I, I'm just to trying that. to be nice, Daniel. <laughs> um, the level of enthusiasm, level of commitment, the you know things that they were saying and the way they were acting, it was you know pretty telling. So I think we were actually quite quite we were convinced quite quickly. And for you, Daniel, what was the filming process like? You know, I see that Alexei and the whole team was already documenting quite a bit of their own um, movements and political movement. And then at what point, um, you know, I'd love to hear, like, were you on the plane filming, like, all of those different points? And at which point, I mean, did you get concerned about your crew's safety along with Alexei and everyone else? Like, what, how did you navigate those points? Well, to speak to the first part of your question, Navalny was someone who's just really interested in media. He loves Instagram and TikTok and YouTube. That's sort of where he's most comfortable. Uh, a media that he wasn't so familiar with is cinema. And I think it was sort of up to us to explain to him uh, the, the virtue of, 
documentary cinema. It's something that didn't quite uh, come naturally. Um, but more than anything, Navalny, I think, really enjoyed being a documentary subject, and, and that's very important. So many film subjects, uh, you know, will let you come in for five minutes and then you're gone. It's, it's sort of like pulling teeth. And that hesitance and reluctance and guardedness comes through on screen. But for Alexei, he was just very interested, I think, in having the cameras around and learning how it all worked and, and, and how we would light a scene or, or how I was sort of conceiving of what the film would be. And because of that, he was a really active participant in the filming process. Like He was really uh, gracious with his time, and, and there really wasn't anything that he said no to. Anything we wanted to film, he, he would be a good sport for. If I told him that I wanted to go up into the mountains and get him running in the snow at you know 6.30 in the morning on a Sunday, um, he was game. We went and did it. Um, and I think that generosity of spirit and his pure charisma is really where the film gets its heart and soul. Uh, the humor of this film, the courage, uh, all comes from this guy. Um, and, and getting to work with a subject like that, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like winning the documentary uh, jackpot. Well, it definitely shows. I feel like for such heavy issues that he's dealing with, that sense of humor really shines. And I wondered, what was the editing process like? I mean, I think you keep that level of t intensity, um, suspense, you know, of what is actually at risk here. But then you also have these moments of just like his own humor and ease and you're kind of like, how can you laugh about all of this? But at the same time, how can you like not have a sense of humor to get through it all? Yeah, I mean, everything emanates from the subject, right? So his humor and his irony and his twisted view on the world uh, as, a, as a way to get toward a more, you know, positive future where, where political prisoners aren't being locked up in, in Russia, et cetera, um, obviously was what that gave the cue to all of us to lean into the humor um, and then also our role as documentarians to be intimate with our subject and also um, contextualize and question and challenge um, gave rise to a lot of challenges in the edit in terms of finding ways to, to, to be on Alexei's team and and wonder what, what is that team? What does that mean? What are, what are they actually trying to do? Because I don't know what it's like in Russia, and Daniel, none of us have lived in Russia, and Maria obviously was a big part of our conduit into that, but Alexei and all of his projects and all of the people of Russia that are supporting him were really the, the emotional thread that we were following to find this story, and so, um, because in many ways we felt like this story, obviously it brought together a lot of people on this team that haven't worked together before. And it was in many ways Alexei that all of us had been aware of in the news and had different experiences within, within documentary filmmaking and suddenly this project was like a lightning in the bottle moment that from the moment the shooting started till the moment we announced that we were in Sundance two days before premiering in Sundance after the first weekend, which was all very weird uh, for security reasons. Um, it all felt supercharged and everybody was determined to make the most of it. And in basically service to cinema, an emotional experience, and a subject who is up against insurmountable odds for the sake of a democracy that I think we're all really craving. You know, and it's just, it's a beautifully balanced film, so thank you. Um, I'd love to see if any audience has questions. Yes. I, I remember those protests because they came to protest our movie. And I thought it was very strange because right now, Alexei Navalny is locked up in a gulag, six and a half, half hours outside of Moscow. Uh, essentially, he is locked up uh, on fabricated charges. And the reason he's in specifically solitary confinement is largely to do with his political activism and his anti-war activism. And every opportunity the man gets to speak before the world instead of defending himself in a court of law, he speaks out against this war. 
and I understand that it's a sensitive time, but I think demonizing everything Russian and every Russian person is also problematic. And we have to realize that an alternate vision for what Russia's future um, could look like is possible, and it's being offered by people like Navalny, brave uh, activists who are fighting for a better future, a democratic future. Um, and I think people around the world, although they can uh, question his, perhaps, his tactics or parts of his history, uh, they must support him in his goal to, to form a democratic Russia. I think that's so important. Maria? Um, well, yes, you, 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 you've put it all very nicely. All, all I can add is that at this point of time, and at this, with, with what's going on with the invasion of Ukraine, I would personally understand every emotion that any Ukrainian person is experiencing towards Russians. As irrational or illogical as that may be, I, I, I would understand everything completely. I, want to, I would understand people slamming doors in front of me just for the fact that I'm Russian, people writing awful things and threatening me on Twitter, just again because I'm Russian and because I tweet in Russian. And I just put a stop and a big block on, on this topic. I'm not going to fight back. I'm not going to try to prove anything. The best way for us um, as a Russian political uh, power, a political force to fight this is to actually um, fight this in Russia and uh, invest into converting as many Russians as we can into the Russians that actually know the truth. Uh, since the very first day of the war, it's actually it's been, no, we started three or four days before the war when it was clear that the war is imminent. We, is, at the, at the Anti-Corruption Foundation, we started a new YouTube channel. It was an act of desperation. You know, we, we, it was very clear that something really bad is about to happen, but what can we do? Like we can, should we run to the forest and wear, you know, a camouflage and try, like that's pointless, like it's not enough of us. Um, so we thought we would do what we do best, and this is YouTube. Um, and that news channel that we started is called Popular Politics Today. In less than a year, in nine months, it has 1.7 million subscribers and it's watched by 20, 22 million unique view viewers. Um, a month and every day since day zero of the war, we haven't skipped a day, we're live every evening from seven to nine. Now we have many more shows and we just keep doing what we do best, finding information, verifying it and um, giving this information to as many people as we can. So this is what we chose out of uh, the ways that we can contribute towards the um, victory of Ukraine, which I think A, is imminent, B, is completely necessary for uh, to put an end to Putin's regime. But you're, and you guys are doing, but you're doing all that work from outside. Yes. Like, you all have had to leave. And yeah. so, it's, it's an interesting, so, I mean, the, and, and Alexei is half Ukrainian. And so, you're outsiders from Russia. Well, Alexei's like uh, personal risks are much higher because obviously every time when he says, like, I have two or three criminal cases against me for uh, referring to the war as the war, you're not allowed to do that in Russia. You're meant to call it a special operation for um, talking about genocide and butcher and then something else as well. So technically, to me, they can do nothing. I'm here. Like, they, it's just like I'm collecting those criminal cases as little, you know, badges of honor. Uh, but uh, it's, a bit, it's very different with Navalny because he's doing the very same thing, writing about genocide and Bucha, calling the war the war, but he's doing that on his Instagram while being physically in Russia in prison. So it's technically every word that he says, every Instagram post that he does, and he passes a lot of them uh, through his lawyers, that's extra, that's another 10 to 12 years in prison. So these are the risks that he's carrying, but he still is doing that, as Daniel said, at every opportunity. He literally, like, uh, during the court hearings, he doesn't talk about the case, he talks about Ukraine and the war. Thank you. So the question is, uh, the last words, literally the last words of the film are, um, Alexei is saying, don't be inactive. Um, and the gentleman asked me, what are the ways to actually, you know, 
perform on, 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 on the words that uh, Alexei is saying and do something while being based abroad uh, and while being highly skilled IT people and um, this sort of crowd. So um, the, I mean, the answer is um, everybody has to find that specific kind and level of contribution that one is comfortable with. Uh, some IT, highly skilled IT specialists would be, I don't know, hacking government databases, and they're doing that. We, we're seeing a lot of leaks, etc. cetera. Um, at the same time, um, well, it's perfectly understandable that not everybody wants to do that, and um, some of the highly skilled IT specialists come to our team, for example, and help us build a website. Um, which is a completely innocent thing to do, and um, there are no specific risks associated with that, especially because it's not public. You don't have to announce that you're doing that. Um, so um, you, if you would like to join um, the anti-corruption, the Navalny's team, this is a good moment to do that because we just about a month ago, we announced that we are reopening our regional headquarters. Uh, we used to have representation in 88 Russian cities, like physical offices. So obviously we're not going to have physical offices anymore. Um, but we are still going to run it virtually in a very, like, very, very anonymous basis, technically without knowing or storing people's names, but we will still be trying to coordinate them. And I know that at least, um, I've, I've, I've seen that number a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, 17,000 people applied. So there are 17,000 people inside Russia who are ridiculously, crazily brave to, to, to sign up for this against all the odds. So now it's a good opening. We are trying to allocate to those 17,000 people into groups of how they can be useful um, in this process. And obviously, the IT bunch is the biggest one. And there are, like, that's, that, th 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 this crowd is very active. And I'm pretty sure that we're going to have many things that we will offer um, to do as volunteers. Thank you. Um, we have actually moved um, a while ago. We moved one year before everybody else did. Uh, what this lady is referring to is that there was like a mass evacuation essentially out of Russia. There were a couple of waves when the war started on 24th of February. A lot of people left to those who just weren't comfortable with the fact that they live in the country which is at war with the uh, neighboring state. Um, then um, journalists and political activists left within the next couple of weeks because of the ridiculous pressure and prison sentences that other people were getting and the new laws that have been passed. I already mentioned them, the law that prohibits to call the war a war and all of this. So this is when the journalists left. And there has been a third wave of people evading mobilization. And that, was, that happened in September this year. So a lot of people left during 2022, but we left in 2021 uh, because we've been designated a status of an extremist organization. So we are and I'm on the same list with Al-Qaeda, ISIS, um, and other very well-known terrorist organizations. So we couldn't possibly keep working in Russia and we had to leave. And that in a way, it was a very rushed process. Obviously, we had to leave overnight. Uh, our, uh, my colleagues couldn't take anything like from a backpack with them. Um, all of their belongings, their flats, everything they owned in, in, in their lives, that all stayed in Moscow, where we were, and, and they, just, they just drove to Lithuania, to Vilnius, this is where we are now. Uh, but that, these sad events kind of worked out quite well for us, because when it happened to everybody else a year later with the war, we've been the most prepared. We've been the ones who have rented an office, hired people, started to pay, you know, salaries normally, started to have like good work processes. So we were actually able to welcome a lot of people who started to be in exactly the same position like we were a year ago. Uh, we helped them with visas, we helped them with transportation. I personally helped someone to transport um, lizard. From, from 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 Siberia to to Lithuania. So in case anybody's interested, I know the ways. Oh, and a snail as well. It was it was like a little team, a lizard and a snail, a big one, not a small one, big one. You couldn't just put it in your pocket. Uh, but we consider that. <laughs> we consider that. Um, so um, we ha yes, we have this new life now, and. Um, for us, a couple of people who are in charge of that, we actually consciously, we decided to rent the nicest office we could afford. 
uh, in the nicest place of Vilnius and build it ourselves and make it nice because we want it to this extreme and very devastating and sad circumstances to actually feel a little bit lighter for those people who um, who moved. And I think we succeeded. Now I see, I don't know, like I was leaving the office on Friday late at night at 11. There were like four alternative parties. People do actually like hanging out at the office and they spend their weekends there. They, I don't know, play board games and enjoy their life, their new life, which they haven't chosen, but they still try to get as much out of it as possible. But we all hope to come back, obviously, as soon as we can. Thank you. I just want to thank all of you for sharing this and, you know, it's such an important topic. And I wondered if you just have any last thoughts you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap up. I want to know how the lizard's doing. Well, it's about to get its Lithuanian citizenship, I think. <laughs> and the, you know, the EU pet passport. That's a very nice <laughs> story. Langdon, any final thoughts? Thanks everybody for coming out. Late night, yeah. thanks for being here. Really appreciate it.